Good morning. Brace yourself. What's on the way? We just want their pain. Doctors were out and nurses will be back on the picket too, saying no to the deal their leaders brokered with ministers after months of argument in that bitter winter. They will continue for as long as it takes to get this government round the table to make a realistic pay offer. So more strikes are on the way, with possible risks for patients too. And it's a serious setback for the government who aren't backing down from their deal. This is going to be better for patients who depend on the NHS, but also better for NHS staff. But with nurses, teachers, civil servants, just some of those in dispute, we have one big question this morning. Can we avoid a summer of strikes? In the last half hour, the health secretary has written to Pat Cullen, the woman who will lead the nurses onto the picket lines for their most serious strike yet. She's with us live this morning. And so will be the cabinet minister, Tory chairman, Greg Hans. How will the government stop the strike from happening? But you might wonder, does Labour have a better answer? The Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, is with us. Uh, uh, and we'll lift our eyes to the heavens. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer has begun its eight-year journey hunting for life beyond Earth. Professor Carol Mundell is the lead scientist of the mission that sent it into space, and she's with us here on Earth. And to keep our feet on the ground with me here at the news desk, Saffron Cordry, who speaks for NHS providers who represent hospital managers. She'll help us work out what the strikes mean. Mark Bailey is the boss of Compare the Market that knows how we are spending or not. And economics brain box Stephanie Flanders from Bloomberg will help keep us right. Morning, morning. So there are more nurses' strikes on the way. We're going to try and find out how long they might last, how bad it might get, and how they could be avoided. But first, let's have a look at the front pages. The Observer goes with that story, saying the nurses are planning a mega strike. The Mail on Sunday claims to have saved the Grand National after some of the disruption there yesterday. And the Sunday Telegraph talks about the government's decision to get rid of some smart motorways. Um, the Sunday Times has another health story about a breast cancer surgeon. The Sunday Mail, which has been making much of the running on the SNP police investigation, talks about Nicola Sturgeon's emails. And the Mirror talks about health workers who might be on their way to the coronation. So let's then, Saffron, start with the strikes. We know there are more to come. We're going to be talking about that a lot, but there's already been a lot of action. Yeah. So what has the impact on patients been so far? Well, we know that there's been a massive impact on patients disruption across the board and we know that there have been much higher risks on patient safety. There are some measurable impacts, so 330,000 procedures, operations, appointments cancelled so far and that's not including this week's strikes that have just gone and there are the wider costs as well. The impact on recovery from Covid, the impact on staff, morale and critically the impact on productivity. So it's, it's a re big deal. Really significant already. I mean, 300,000 yeah. people have been affected so far. I mean, Stephanie, what about the impact on the economy? I mean, it was interesting this week. We saw the Office for National Statistics actually start to put some numbers on it. Yes, well, we had, because we had the monthly uh, GDP output figures, you know, how much the economy produced in February. And it was expected to be positive, but actually the economy had, had flatlined. And that was, it did look like it was entirely due to, to those strikes because of the reduction in activity in, in the government sector. So, you know, along with everything else and all the other impacts of the strikes, the fact that we've got more working days lost than at any time since the early 90s, um, I think is sort of contributing to that feeling that the economy is still stagnating. And Mark, through your business, you know, you have lots of contact with, with, with thousands and thousands of people every day. Are you seeing people changing their behaviour as a result of the strikes? Um, whenever we see lots of news flow about something, we do see people changing their behaviour. In the last three months, we've seen an 80% increase in people looking for private medical insurance. 80%? 80%. So we're seeing somewhere between 90 and 100,000 people a month looking to get private medical insurance at the moment. That's a really significant change then. Uh, yes. 
So in all sorts of ways, we're seeing impacts of the of the strikes, and not just at, not just in health, of course, because there's been widespread industrial unrest. We'll talk to Pat Cullen from the RCN in just a second, but we'll also then hear from Labour's Wes Streeting. And Saffron, I just wanted to ask you ahead of that, if there's one thing that health bosses would like to hear from the Labour Party, what would it be? I think the fundamental thing that we need to do also is sort out social care. Okay. So it would be really great to hear, you know, what's the deal going to be struck with the voting public around social care and reforms to that? Absolutely critical. OK, well, we'll put that to him a bit later. Yeah. All three of you, thank you very much for now. But stay there, hard work for you ahead to help us through the stories this morning. Now, let's then hear from the woman herself, who in December last year led the Nurses' Union into its first UK-wide strike in its 106-year history. Just think about that for a second. But then, after a bitter standoff, real negotiations with ministers started and the strikes were paused. And eventually there was a deal, a pay rise of 5% and a one-off bonus of at least £1,500 for health workers. Now that agreement was approved by the RCN leadership, but late on Friday, the members narrowly but clearly said no. Well, Pat Cullen is here back with us in the studio. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Um, you did the deal. You recommended it. Why then did your members say no? Well, I have the greatest respect for our members and uh, they believed that this deal was neither fair nor reasonable. And if you've just said, Laura, uh, our members took historic action the first time in 106 years. And for them, this pay deal was not historic. In fact, what they have said very loud and clear that um, the one off bonus that was given to them was actually probably a bribe in their eyes. It isn't going to fix the long term problems within the NHS, which is really the, the fundamental issue that nurses went on but, strike for. But on that deal, Pat, you thought it was fair. You thought the deal was worth it. And yet you, you failed to persuade your members. Well, I'm always um, I, I'm, I'm directed by our members. Our members do know what's what's right. Um, our governors, their, so their, own elected, their own elected governors, the people that our members elected into the college, deliberated long and hard about this offer. And what they came to the conclusion about was that they wouldn't gamble with people's livelihoods. There's money on the table, and knowing this government, we cannot um, determine whether or not that money will stay on the table. And that's the reason that our elected governors decided to put this to our members and recommend it. But we are now in a position where our members have made that decision. We believe it is the right decision. The decision is that we need to fix the health service. We need to fix the problems in nurses, we st in, in nursing. We still have tens of thousands of vacant posts and a one-off payment uh, put on the table described as a COVID bonus it is not going to fix the health service. So let's service. talk then about how this situation might get fixed. Now you've had a letter from the Health Secretary Steve Barclay just in the last half hour. You've called for urgent talks. What's his response to you been? Well it's interesting that it's taken the Health Secretary days to respond to my letter. Uh, and I get it half an hour before I'm coming on your programme. So I'd ask, I wonder why, first of all. And that's not about being disrespectful to me. It's been disrespectful to over 500,000 nurses that I represent. Um, what has he fact, said, though? In fact, what a, it says very little, Laura. Uh, it actually says very little. He has spent longer writing in the sun today than he has responding to our half million nurses. And what does it say? It says that he believes the bonus that they have put on the table is enough and nurses should accept that and continue to work in the high risk areas that they're working with the understaffing that they've got. And he's asking you to pause the strike action though. Will you do that? No. Our nurses will absolutely not do that. We have strike action for the end of this month, beginning of May, and then we will move immediately to ballot our members. And if that ballot is successful, it will mean further strike action um, right up until Christmas. Now, the person that can stop that, and the people that can stop that, is Steve Barclay and the ministers, and indeed the Prime Minister. And I would urge them again today that add to the money that they've put on the table, respect nursing, respect the health service, and let's get a resolution to this. And we'll hear from the government in more detail a bit later on, but I want to talk about the action that your members are now going to take again. In a couple of weeks, your members will, for the first time, in a different way to the strikes we've already had, walk out of accident and emergency departments, cancer wards, there won't be any so-called derogations, the sort of deals that were put in place to try to protect care. Now, that is a significant escalation 
of the kind of action you were taking before. Why is it justified? Well, because this government um, has not listened. That's, that's frankly the answer to that. But that's not patients fault? No, it's not, it's not. And the patients are getting a raw deal from this government, have done so for a long number of years, as have nurses, tens of thousands of vacant posts. But what I want to say to every patient that's listening this morning, the health service is in a crisis, a crisis caused by this government, not our nurses. This government can't say on one hand, we value nurses so much that they shouldn't go on strike and then we don't value, value them enough to pay them. And that's why we're in the crisis we're in. But, but, but nurses will not turn their backs on patients. When we are on strike at any time, we've had six days so far, nurses made sure at all times that patient safety was at the core of all decision making. We'll continue to do that. And should there be a major incident or a particular incident that nurses um, will have to deal with during a strike, they will return immediately as they will have done from picket lines but, right throughout But for this. anybody watching this morning, Pat Cullen, something that would happen to them or their family is a major incident. And I'd like to read to you something that one of your members said, Clint Cooper, who's a nurse at Scarborough Hospital. Now he shares the concerns of colleagues, but is not going to take part in this more significant escalation of strike action. And they said, last week I had two patients who were very poorly. I wonder if I hadn't been there and had escalated, would they still be alive if I had walked out? That's my conscience talking to me. What's your conscience saying to you? And I think, about this more dramatic and, yeah. action. And I think Greg's like hundreds of thousands of nurses every day that are battling with a health service that is underfunded has been left with, with total neglect by this, by this government with tens of thousands, 47,000 vacant nurses, nursing posts. It's nurses like Greg that spend every day trying to find their way through that, understaffed, dealing with high levels of risk, morning, noon and night, not just in hospitals but in community. And we've continued to do that mm. with a government that expects nurses to do it. And yet, why are nurses quitting their posts? Because they can no longer take the risk and take the pressures that this government expects them to and, operate under. And that's your under. view on the, on the general situation. I want to press you again on the specifics of taking a different kind of strike action, a more radical strike action where there won't be the same kind of protections that there have been before. Do you accept by any reasonable logic that this strike will put patients in more danger? It will create more risk for patients. And I have to say back to you, Laura, patients are at risk every single day in this health service. Um, not just on days when nurses are taking strike action. You They're taking strike action worse. to highlight these risks. They are absolutely taking strike action to highlight the risks. And not every nurse will be not available for work on a day of strike. There'll be many, many nurses that don't belong to our union who will continue to work. It won't be that we'll find our hospitals with no nurses. And indeed, there'll be nurses like Greg who will not take strike action. And that is absolutely their right and we'll respect that. Will you consider striking alongside junior doctors? Because there's a lot of concern if those two things happen at the same time, that could be extremely dangerous. And one of the NHS leaders said this morning, there might not even be basic care if that happened. Well, first thing I would say is that we work very closely with the BMA in the same way as doctors and nurses work closely on every single shift. There are no plans in place from the Royal College of Nursing to coordinate strikes with doctors. There are, there no. are no plans? No. But one of your deputies said a couple of nights ago that it might be a possibility. Are you ruling out taking action at the same time as junior doctors now? We have no plans in place to coordinate strikes. That's not but the what, same as ruling what, it what, out. But what, we, what, what I would say is that the impact and the effect, if this government continues to turn their back on the nurses and doctors that are striking, of course, of course, patients and the NHS will feel the, the impact of both doctors and nurses striking. But what I'm saying as the General Secretary of the College this morning, there are no plans in place to coordinate strikes but, with, but with is it, junior doctors. But for our viewers watching this morning, is it a possibility that in the coming months, there might be a day where junior doctors and nurses are both on the picket lines rather than on the wards? Look, I can only speak for the Royal College of Nursing this morning. And what I'm saying is we have no plans in place to coordinate strikes. But if the government continues to allow doctors and nurses to spend their time on picket lines and not 
in their places of work, in their hospitals and communities, then of course the impact of those strikes, whether coordinated or not, will be felt by our patients. So it is a possibility. I mean, I can hear you're quite carefully trying to navigate here. It's not something you're trying to coordinate deliberately, but it is a possibility for our viewers this morning to hear that there might be a day in the next few months where neither doctors nor nurses are at work. I don't think I can make it any clearer, Laura. I have no plans in place as the General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing to plan strikes with the junior doctors. Uh, one hospital boss has told the BBC in the last couple of days that they can't comprehend how bad that might be and that they're full of anxiety about that, even as a vague possibility. Could you really justify it? I mean, I, I just wonder also, you've, you know, you articulate the serious concerns of nurses. But is there any point at which you might step back from action because the risks to the NHS just felt too great? Look, nurses haven't stood back from the NHS now for years and they've managed risk um, every single solitary day for the last 10 years um, and certainly throughout the time of this, of this government. Uh, so the risks are there, Laura. They're not just there on the day of strike action. The risks within the health service to our patients are growing every single day because we do not have the doctors and the nurses to look after our patients. Patients deserve better. The public of this country deserve better. And it's for the government now to step up and ministers and look seriously at how are they going to fix the health service and they're going to do that by paying nurses and doctors properly so that we can retain them in the health service. So what then does that mean being paid properly? So you started out with your bargaining position asking for 19%. Um, you then in this studio suggested 10% might be enough. The deal as we've heard ended up with 5% with a one-off bonus. What are you asking for now? And if you won't be drawn on specifics, on a scale, would a few tweaks to this be enough? Or are you asking the government <clears throat> comprehensively to rethink their offer? Look, um, our members have spoken loud and clear in, in this vote and in this ballot. So what we're asking the government is certainly not to remove anything that they've put on the table, because that would be detrimental to where we are trying to get to. They need to add to it. I've always said I wouldn't but negotiate. I wouldn't say. I've always said respectfully, Laura, that I will not negotiate on the air. But are you asking for something that would be a few tweaks or a sweetener, or are you asking for a comprehensive rethink? And bearing in mind that you yourself said it was a fair offer, you said it was the final offer. Are you asking for a big rethink or a, f a few tweaks? Now, I don't think I've ever been noted to say that this was a fair offer. I said it was the best Final offer. The best. I said it was the best offer that we could get from this government at this point in time. Our members have said it's not fair and it's not reasonable, and I absolutely support them in that. We need to continue now to work with this government to make sure that they get a fair, reasonable, and a historic pay offer, given the historic position that our nurses find themselves in. Respectfully, I'm not going to do that on the airwaves, but I do believe that this, this, this Secretary of State and this government needs to get around the table very, very quickly and to start to put more money on the table, to start to treat nurses with a bit of decency and a bit of respect. That's not going to be hard to do, but they need to put money on the table. Um, so you've also very clearly there said that it has to be a bigger financial offer, but I just want to ask you also, having been, you know, led your members out on strike in this way for the first time in more than a hundred years but the offer you tried to sell was rejected there have also it's in the sunday times this morning and there were some members of the rcn who tried to organize a petition to have a vote of no confidence in in your leadership given the situation are you confident that you're the best person to try and sort this out Yes, I do. <clears throat> Absolutely. I've been a nurse for 43 years. Um, I've been a leader of this college now for less than two years. There are issues with, with, with the petition. We know that. It's subject to um, an investigation. And I'll wait for that investigation to conclude to look at um, the fraud that may be associated with that petition. Now, that petition uh, was not just about anger towards me, but I'm annoyed and, and actually disappointed that uh, it's about how they've treated their other, the other members of the Royal College. But I'll wait for the conclusion of that report and then we'll take the appropriate action. Now, you said at the beginning of our conversation that there'll be another ballot of your members, there'll be another vote and there could be strike action all the way up until Christmas. Just can you say to our viewers this morning how likely that might be a series of rolling strikes for you know more than another six months? 
Mm -hmm. And that's a question, isn't it, for, for Steve Barclay and for Rishi Sunak. It's a question for uh, you too. Yes, it is. Uh, but it's, a, it's fundamentally a question. But they've got the answer to that. The answer to that is to put more money on the table for our nursing staff. Treat them properly. Make sure that we can fill every vacant post that we've got. That's what the people of England deserve. It's what every patient deserves. We hear that more and more patients now have had to resort to private health insurance um, um, so that they because they can't get the treatment mm -hmm. and care that they've paid into the NHS for year over year. And why not? Because our nurses are leaving in droves. We hear now the doctors are leaving in droves. This is a government that has turned their back on the NHS and now we need to all get round the table and make sure that the crisis within this NHS is sorted out. Okay Pat Cullen we'll put that to the government a bit later on in the programme but thanks very much for coming in and Thank giving you. us your time this morning a fast moving situation. Now we want to know from you if you've already faced any of the consequences of the strikes have you had an operation delayed or cancelled perhaps because of the industrial action or are you on the side of the health workers who've been on the picket line you can email us Kunzberg at bbc.co.uk or use the hashtag if you are social media inclined BBC Laura Kay and as ever there is a whole conversation going on on the BBC website's live page too we love to hear from you we know you know that we sometimes use your questions so do get in touch maybe you think there is a different approach Labour's Wes Streeting may believe that there is a different approach he's with us now in the studio let's hear what he has to say um, Wes thank you for coming in do you support the Royal College of Nurses escalating their action and taking another more serious strike day? Well, I'm really worried about it, particularly the um, decision they appear to have taken to remove derogations, the exemptions they put in place previously around emergency care, cancer care. I think that's a real risk to patient uh, safety. I hope they don't feel that escalating in that way is necessary. So do you hope they don't I, then? I really hope they don't. I, I must say, I, I think the dereliction of leadership from the government this week has been appalling. We've barely seen or heard anything of the health secretary. The prime minister told parliament he didn't want to get in the middle of this. Well, you're the prime minister in the middle of the biggest crisis in the history of the NHS. Mm. We've seen hundreds of thousands of cancelled operations real risk to patient safety, not my words, the words of NHS leaders. And the Prime Minister doesn't think he's got to get in the middle but of this and sort it out. But do the Labour Party, you've, you've expressed concerns about a more significant strike. Does the Royal College of Nurses therefore not have the Labour Party support? We don't want to see um, strikes go ahead in the NHS. We don't want to see an escalation. Uh, I, what I do want to see is the government recognising that their approach to these strikes, the refusal to negotiate for months... But, but the question the here is whether the Labour Party supports the Royal College of Nurses. Do you back this stri strike action or no, not? No, no. I mean, how could I? I mean, there's a risk to patient safety. It's not that it wouldn't be the right thing to do. I understand why they're in this position. When you've got a government that tells nurses that they're helping Vladimir Putin in Ukraine by going on strike, it's not surprising that nurses don't have a great deal of goodwill towards the government. And, and when, you, you know, just this week, in fact, just today, in fact, you've got the health secretary writing in the Sun newspaper uh, as if he's sort of writing an agony aunt column, as if somehow he ha is a commentator, a passive observer, rather than someone with not just power, but responsibility to try and resolve these strikes. And uh, the final thing I'll just say, Laura, is whether it's junior doctors, whether it's nurses, we're going to be back here again and again and again unless the government can give people a sense of hope and light at the end of the tunnel that things are going to get better. And I think that's what's missing. And they're repeating the mistakes they made with the nurses all over again with junior doctors. The disruption this week was worse than the nurses, mm -hmm. and yet there hasn't even been any negotiation. They're not except, even around the table with the junior doctors. Except we're Actually, it's important to note that the biggest health union, Unison, did accept the offer after a they negotiation did, and, with the uh, government. They, they did. And let's talk then, you, you, you've been critical of the government's handling, but let's talk about how you would fix it if you were in the job that you want to do, which is to be the health secretary for the Labour Party. You said that the nurse's original ask of 19% was unaffordable. Would 10% be affordable? Well, I think what we need is a workforce plan. Uh, the government have promised a workforce mm -hmm. plan because, uh, as I've said before, We've got to see these strikes in the context of retention mm -hmm. of NHS staff. And I think the even bigger risk isn't just that people walk out for more days of industrial action, is they walk out of the NHS altogether. And whether, when you compare pay rates in the NHS to other sectors, including retail, mm -hmm. when you compare social care pay rates, mm -hmm. 
there's a degree of uncompetitiveness now. So people are walking out, so would as well as going to other countries. So, so, so would you offer 10%? As with 10%? Pat Cullen, I'm not going to sit here on your programme and pluck numbers out of the air and negotiate on air. But that's not plucking numbers out of the air. I mean, our viewers want to get an idea of how Labour would handle it differently. You say very strongly the government's made a mess of it, so how would you fix it? Would 10% be affordable in your view? Well, I wouldn't expect the Health Secretary to uh, make commitments on air now. What I would expect him to do is sit around the table and negotiate, and that's what a Labour government But you've said to do. us previously that 19% was unaffordable. You said that 35% for the junior doctors was unaffordable. So you are happy sometimes to talk about numbers. Um, so I'll ask you again, is 10% affordable? Well, we'll, set out, we'll set out our manifesto policies, which will be fully costed and fully funded this is at, the, situation right at the next right now. general election. I know, Lauren, that's why the Health Secretary should be here, but he isn't. And frankly, I'm fed up of coming on programmes and being asked how I a Labour spokesperson would fix Conservative problems tomorrow as if I'm in government tomorrow. I'm not in government tomorrow. The Conservatives are. You, They're not here. They government. don't answer questions. They don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. and, and what we are doing is setting out, I think, the substantial answers the NHS needs to make sure we're not here again and again. Take our workforce plan, the biggest expansion of NHS staff in history. More doctors, more nurses, more midwives, more district nurses fixing the fundamental shortage of staff in the NHS so that we don't end up back here over and over again. Of course, should we win the next general election and there are pay rounds, there'll be talks, there'll be negotiations, and I'll be very happy to come back and say how Labour is handling specific pay rises at specific points there's then. An, an interesting... But what we're doing this far out from the election mm -hmm. is in broad terms setting out the fundamental things we need to fix about the NHS and hopefully making sure that we've got an economic plan that sees sustained growth in the economy so that we can invest in people's pay and our public services without having to hike up taxes what's in, on working what's people interesting in the way though, that the what's, in, what's interesting though, Wes, is you as a potential and an, an aspiring Labour health secretary is that you are quite happy to say that the RCN is taking the wrong approach by escalating their strike action. You said previously that the doctors union and the BMA, I think you said in that chair that sometimes you found them completely maddening. I mean, you're, you're quite happy as a Labour politician to pick holes in what the unions are doing. Do you think if you do get to help be health secretary, you might have a bit of a tricky time getting them on board? You're quite happy to well, be we unpopular with, with the we unions? We want to work with people and we want to give NHS staff a sense there's some light at the end of the tunnel and they're not going to continue to work on understaffed shifts and they're not going to continue to feel completely not just burned out but going home at the end of the day feeling a sense of moral injury because despite doing their level best they are seeing care for patients which falls below the standards they would expect and through no fault of their own. I, I think that's what's reflected in um, part by the RCN ballot result. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a, a part of the workforce, the nursing workforce, who feel I think really beaten up really let down and really undervalued by the government well, let's and talk we want to change that and people can judge us on our record look at what the last Labour government did not just with record low waiting times and record high patient satisfaction but sustained year after year investment and fair pay for staff because we got the economy growing and that's why when Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves talk about the importance of getting growth back into the economy this is not some abstract argument it's not just for sort of people like Stephanie to sort of have some positive numbers to look at at work for a change it's about the power of the pound in people's pockets and the value of, of the their things, wages and being and, able to and, invest in public services without hiking things, up taxes. One of the things that many people would agree needs investment desperately is social care. Now Saffron Cordray who you'll know she represents NHS uh, managers she said the one thing she would really like to know from you is what you're going to do about social care. Now, I know there's a review that's been conducted. It was commissioned, I think, back in September. Where is it? When are we going to see the results? Yeah, so um, the Fabian site is doing a uh, review. We're going to get that back shortly, uh, I believe. But I think what I can say now, regardless, is a, a couple of really important things. The, the first is that when you look at what the government has done with the funding for delayed discharges, for example, significant investment arrived too late hasn't made a single your, bit of difference plan, on, so, on a point of principle under a labor government would social care be free at the point of use we, we can't we can't say universal for everyone free at the point of use i mean that would be a hugely expensive big overnight change what i want to see is a long-term plan that gets us towards a social care system which is accessible to everyone uh, has consistent standards for everyone uh, and is affordable for everyone and has a workforce that can deliver it. Because I think what social care and the NHS have in common is that unless you've got the staff you, you need, 
to provide the service, you don't have a service. And we are seeing people leave social care in droves, social care providers struggling to recruit because we've but got who poverty will, who pay. Who will pay? I mean, would people uh, be protected from having to sell their house to fund their care under your plan? Would you hope that would be part of it? Well, we're, we're thinking really carefully about the promises that go into our manifesto because where I don't want to be is where we've been under successive uh, governments and successive Conservative manifestos in recent years of big promises being made and then don't, no delivery. Um, I, I think my starting point is around the social care workforce, mm -hmm. making sure they're fairly paid so we can recruit and retain uh, the best people and also to look at the quality of care uh, that care users, whether they are disabled people or older people uh, requiring care later in life. Uh, those are the sort of my two starting points and priorities. Okay, well, we're stressing. Thank you very much for coming in. Maybe you'll come back when that social care Absolutely. review comes back, because as you were saying, and as we've heard so often in the studio, staffing is such a huge part of the problems across the public services. But we've heard a bit from Labour. We want to hear from you. We've heard from Pat Cullen at length. Let's go back to our panel. Um, I'm sure you were all listening carefully to what Pat Cullen and, and West Streeting had to say. Um, Saffron, as someone in the front line of trying to work out what's going on in the health service. What did you make of what Pat Cullen had to say about the strikes coming up? Well, I think we are in that really difficult situation, aren't we? And it's really clear to me that it's not sustainable going forward for the NHS to manage strike action. You know, it, it feels like a really ugly situation to say we're going to have strikes now until Christmas. So we really desperately need... Um, the government to come to the table alongside the unions coming to the table to sort this out. And alongside that, we've got to make sure that there is the funding available for any settlement and that they've got that they actually published the plan that they've got for the workforce in the long term. They keep promising it, but it's not coming. And I think that that would give people some assurance that there's a funded plan for the future. And you, you say it's not sustainable to go on like this, but do you think, especially if there were to be junior doctors and nurses out on strike at the same time, would people lose their lives needlessly because of that action? I know that's a, a tough question, but I think we want to be clear with the audience. Do you think that would happen? I think it's really difficult to say whether that is the case or not, but we know that there are significantly higher levels of risk, not just in hospitals, in mental health care. Everyone is affected by these strikes. It's really important to remember that. Mm. Stephanie, the government often uses as its justification not to put more money on the table their concern that inflation, which we know is putting so much pressure on people, will be bumped further up if they hand over lots more money to the public sector. As a very expert economist, does that stack up? <laughs> it is not something that economists tend to agree with, I'm sorry, because if it is very different. If you have a private sector company increase its wages, well, that goes directly into the cost of making that product or service and may well then end up meaning they have to increase the price in the shops. Obviously, that's not the case with public sector workers. There's no, there isn't a price that's going to go up. Of course, there's a bill to be paid, and one always would have to ask questions about where the money's going to come from. Is it going to mm. squeeze other things in the health service? If it's going to increase health spending, which would mean it was additional, obviously there is an additional demand on the economy which could potentially uh, increase inflation at the margins. But I think this, uh, this equivalence, you know, people understand that if a private sector company raises wages, that's going to add to costs and to prices. Um, it just isn't the same thing for public sector workers. And when you've had the kind of gap that's opened up since 2010 between public and private sector workers mm -hmm. in terms of their pay, even with the difference of conditions and other things, you know, that is in itself an issue in terms of morale and in terms of the sort of stability of the system. I mean, Mark, you run a big business now at Compare the Market, but also you were involved in helping the NHS with Test and Trace, which, yep. you know, came in for quite a bit of stick. And yep. Maybe it was something you might wish to forget, I'm not sure. <laughs> but when you look at the different approaches of the different sectors, where wages are, as Stephanie was saying now, very, very different, I mean, how would you as an employer actually approach this mess? Um, look, it's difficult to say large, complex organisations and pay settlements are difficult. I can say what we did last year, which mm. is last year was tough. Um, and we only had 4% was the budget we could afford. Um, the way we approached it is we looked at what the cost of inflation was in pound notes for individuals. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely clear that the people who are bearing the brunt of inflation are the people who are earning less than the average salary in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we structured our entire pay rise towards our lowest paid colleagues. So at the start of their careers, people were getting 10 to 12% pay rises. Our more senior employees were getting 1%. Um, 
But what that meant is we knew we had protected the most vulnerable against the inflation, which will hopefully pass as we get through the end of this year. But I think talking about blanket increases across the whole workforce doesn't really address the issue of who's paying the price. And in terms of who's paying the price right now in the economy, you know, you get lots of data from people day by day about how they're, how they're behaving, what they're spending, why they're, um, how they're dealing with their budgets. What are you seeing at the moment? Um, and as I said, we, we've just had the numbers for March and I was quite taken aback when I saw them. Um, in March, 7.6 million people use Compare the Market to try and save money. That's an increase from 5.4 million a year ago. When we talk to customers to try and understand such an, a big increase, um, half of all households are now saying in the last month they've struggled to pay bills. Those bills have gone up about £750 this year um, and it's now 18 pence in every pound that people are spending. What we see consistently is those people that make big companies compete for their business, mm -hmm. make big companies work, get the savings. So most of us will have had our broadband bills go up by 15% in the last month. Um, I, as I did, I went on and searched. The savings I could see were just under 200 pounds, actually with a faster speed. And getting in a place where getting real wages to rise is going to be hard. Mm -hmm actually getting people to make big companies fight for their business, make them give you the savings you deserve, is what I think is one of the things that will cover the gap we have at so the consumers moment. Consumers are having to work very hard uh, to, to, to make ends meet. But one of the things, Stephanie, people will be looking very closely this week at inflation figures coming up. And I think there's a piece in The Observer this morning that maybe I don't want to tease you, but sort of points to the fact that sometimes economic forecasters get things <laughs> wrong. Quite often, in fact. Um, yeah. But with, with, your, with your crystal ball, um, what can we expect? Because for everybody's wallet, but also for the government, inflation coming down is absolutely vital. Is it going to happen this week? Well, we are. So we're going to get these numbers this week, which will also show what's going on with wages. But when you look at, un when you look at the inflation numbers, um, it, we're pretty confident uh, that the inflation will come under 10%, which I guess is kind of symbolically important. We've been waiting for that for a while. And the only reason we can be a bit more confident of that than most forecasts is we've, we're comparing it to the period a year ago when energy prices jumped a lot. And energy prices have been a big part of the inflation increase. And so as that sort of falls out of the comparison and actually energy prices have fallen in the last year, we should see it come under 10%. Those numbers, when you, if you look at those and look at what's happening with wages, which we'll also see this, this week along with unemployment, you know, the Bank of England will obviously be looking at that and potentially deciding next month, our Bloomberg economists think, they might not increase interest rates. Again, they might have a pause. So that there's be quite a, a lot of disagreement around that. That's a, a big chunk of this depends on the energy price. And we're seeing the, um, the gas price, which really drives the price of power in the UK was 40p for the last decade it reached eight to nine hundred pence last august mm -hmm. so that massive shock and that's the massive shock we're really seeing it's back at 100 now and forecasts are difficult to make but if we carry on on the current trajectory I think this unwinding of the energy shock is... And the only is, thing I'd say is when inflation falls, remember, you've still got the higher prices from before. So yeah. if, you, if your wages haven't kept up, mm -hmm. that hit to your cost of living, your standard of living, and is, is there, of course, is even if the inflation rate's falling, because inflation's just showing you how much prices are going up and further. Exactly. It doesn't mean prices coming down, it no. means increasing less quickly. But um, Saffron, just a final word to you on all of this. I mean, the, the context, I think, that, that, that people look at in terms of the health service gobbling up more and more of the national pie, staff saying that they need more. Um, what, what, do we have to have a sort of reckoning, do you think, about the cost of healthcare? Are politicians, do you think, being honest about the costs? Well, I think it's, it's quite clear that there are some significant policy decisions and fault lines that have got us to where we are. Mm. Demand is going up and it's going up and up. You know, we never seem to see a lid on that. But our spending on public health, for example, mm. prevention 
has come down significantly over the last 10 years. That's one thing we could do mm -hmm. to really get ahead of the curve and make sure that we start to put a lid on, on demand. The pay issue is so critical. I don't want to keep bringing us back to pay, but you know, we, we heard Mark there talking about how, you know, what they do in their company to negotiate pay. We're in a situation with the NHS, over 1.1 million staff, a national negotiation on pay, but we've got trust leaders up and down the country still needing to maintain those relationships with their workforce, lead their organisations, but they're not in the position to really impact on, on that pay. That's fundamental and it really undermines morale. And I think it also speaks to how difficult it's going to be to really kind of turn the corner on improvement, on productivity. It's, it's a really challenging situation. Because for as long as this is going on, some of those big questions aren't, aren't getting answered. Just, just, just finally, could you spell out if there is joint strike action by different unions, doctors and nurses out at the same time? I mean, one health leader told the BBC yesterday that he couldn't comprehend what that might be like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had conversations in our organisations and across the trust leaders about how this would look. And it's, it is really incredibly worrying. We know that when we've had the derogations in the past, it's felt like there's been that safety Some net there, yeah. protection. That will disappear. And I think that we will find ourselves in a situation where already we are devoting so much resource to keeping patients safe in an emergency. That's what has to happen in this situation. What that means, of course, is that we will see the foot coming off the pedal in things like, you know, routine operations, mm -hmm. routine mental health appointments, routine community care visits, those kind of things. So we get a further backlog and then the waiting lists go up more. The NHS has done a brilliant job on waiting lists so far. We have to say that mm -hmm. it's really, really managed well, mm -hmm. but it's not sustainable in the long term. Well, the government very, has to come to the table. It's a very big but. Well, all three of you, thank you very much for your insights. And we'll check back in with you thank at you. the end of the programme. Now, after all of that, I would understand if you might want to get away from it all. So let's go for a few minutes somewhere very, very far away. Two, one, go. Well, the Jupiter mission, the Ariane 5 rocket launched from French Guyana at 14 minutes past nine local time. Juice, or more properly titled the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is sending a satellite to see if Jupiter's moons have the conditions needed to support life. In other words, are there or could there have been aliens there? Now, it will take eight years for the spacecraft to arrive, but Professor Carol Mundell is right here back on Earth, a world-renowned astrophysicist who's the Director of Science at the European Space Agency. We're thrilled to have you here and well done for making it back, maybe not by rocket, but various different modes of transport from the jungle to our studio here in London. Now, the launch was delayed by a day. How did you feel when it finally actually happened? You must have been, I mean, I, I can't even ima imagine. What was it like? I think there are no words, Laura. I mean, we were incredibly proud of the team and I think that delay also helped all of us who were there to really understand physically and, and emotionally how difficult space is. We should never take space for granted. And our teams were so professional. The delay, of course, was disappointing. It was necessary to, to keep the rocket and the payload safe. And the teams had a little bit of rest. They came in at night and they continued to work through the next night doing everything that they had done in the previous 24 hours repeating that so that we would have a safe and and very very successful I think possibly exquisitely successful launch and all the stages that happened after that to get the spacecraft out there and on its journey were just absolutely textbook perfect and I imagine I mean what a huge amount of years of work to get there you were there your team was there and I think we can show viewers also the video that you took from your phone watching from the balcony it's my first launch as well so it's first time I've ever been to a rocket launch and was, was it how you imagined it was then? utterly overwhelming it was very emotional um, the sound comes much later so we were about 12 kilometers away from the launch site some people were closer so we could see the the light of the the, the rocket flames the rocket goes up through the clouds and then of course the sound rumbles gradually and it gets louder and louder possibly isn't even captured on my phone balcony was shaking so it's very physical but then we went inside and our teams then had to continue to make sure the rest of the tasks then completed and then how how does it actually get there? I mean, we see in your video, it just disappears into the cloud, but then it'll take eight years. 
so it that's doesn't right. go a direct route, does it? It doesn't, and that's a, num a number of other firsts for this mission. So I believe it's the most complex and most ambitious mission that we've ever launched, both in terms of its flight path and in terms of the incredible suite of instruments on the satellite. So we, because it's heavy, because we've got so many instruments on there, we didn't have enough power in the rocket to lift it on a straight path. So what we're going to do is a very nifty technique of using the gravitational pull of the planet. So we'll start with a gravitational swing by past the Earth, then between the Earth and Moon, we'll fly by Venus, we'll get data all the way along, so we'll do some free science along the way. And then we'll use this gravitational slingshot effect to make the spacecraft go faster and faster until it can be captured by the gravitational attraction of Jupiter. So you're sort and of using moons. gravity as a catapult right, in yeah, a way. It really, it's a slingshot, literally like a ball on a string. And what are you hoping to find then along the way? I know you'll be capturing all sorts of data for a long time, you know, eight yes, years. Yeah. What are you hoping to find? So the big purpose of this mission is to really find out whether the conditions on the icy moons that orbit, orbit Jupiter could have the conditions for life. So we know there are some things on Earth that produce the, 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 the quality of the system for life. So water, for example. Mm -hmm. So we think that these moons have icy crusts, but below those icy crusts, the ice have, has actually melted. So we think that there are liquid water, possibly salty water oceans below the ice. So we'll study the geology, we'll study all of the conditions of the moons themselves and also the Jupiter moon system because it's like a mini solar system. And does that actually mean does that potentially mean that you might find evidence of some life form? I mean, aliens, I don't want to sort of, you know, go all sci-fi on it, but, it, but I think that's what people will be wondering. Could, there find, could you find evidence of life forms now or life forms in the, in the past out there? So I think the actual test for life itself will be the next mission. So what we're doing is looking to see whether the conditions exist for life, and that is the big breakthrough. We're not going to land on these icy moons, so we don't have the technology to do that yet, but that would be the next step. So maybe future generations of young people you know children in school now inspired by this mission might be working on the missions in the 2050s or 60s to land on an icy moon and take a sample and bring it back and we've talked a lot in this studio actually about the Artemis mission to the moon and we're talking now about Jupiter and we know lot, lots of people are really fascinated by these extraordinary missions and accomplishments but if you're not what's the practical use of all of this if you kind of think oh well it's you know great you're I was living your best life getting to see a rocket launch but what's the practical use it costs a lot of money and uses a lot of fuel so I think the big the big point here really is that much of the technology that we invent and it has to be invented obviously when scientists first came up with the idea of doing this the technology and the engineering didn't exist mm -hmm. so we've had 2,000 scientists and engineers across well across Europe and across the world working on this mission 83 companies across the UK and Europe have been working on this mission now for 10 years so what we've learned in developing that technology is useful for all of our space technology but also what we're doing there is actually testing some of our experiments and that some of the things that we would like to do to help us to understand life on Earth and ultimately to protect our own habitat. Okay, Professor Mundell, thank you so much for coming in. Do come back another time and give us an update on the mission, but it's great to have you. Welcome back to Earth after um, the jungle in French Guiana. Great thank to have you. Now, let's return to our main theme. We were talking to the Nurses Union boss, Pat Cullen, a few minutes ago, and she said very clearly that the government is going to have to offer more to put an end to the nurses' strike. We heard, though, from Labour's Wes Streeting that he's concerned about some of the nurses' approach and them going ahead with a strike that has been escalated. Let's now hear how the government proposes to solve this situation. Greg Hans, Cabinet Minister and Conservative Party Chair, is with us now. Now, Pat Cullen was crystal clear that the government has to put more on the table. Is that going to happen? Uh, well, look, first of all, uh, don't forget that uh, Pat Cullen and the RCN recommended the acceptance of the offer. Uh, we think that the offer is very fair and reasonable, 4% for last year, 5% for this year, uh, plus uh, a cash payment as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, Laura, people don't get paid in percentages, they mm -hmm. get paid in pounds. And when you look at what that means, that's £5,100 extra, £5,100 extra mm -hmm. for a band five nurse, which is a typical ward level nurse, mm -hmm. plus a cash payment, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, within that, a cash payment of £2,000 into the bank account by the summer. So we think it's a very fair and reasonable offer. All of that may be the case, but nurses have said no. That is the situation we are in now. They've said no and they're going to strike again. The government is responsible for trying to manage the situation. So how are you going to fix it? Will you put more money on the table? Well, let's see what the other unions say. Of course, Unison, uh, which represents about a third mm -hmm. of all of the Agenda for Change staff, mm -hmm. 
uh, accepted the very good payout for her. I've already said this you for have, a bad fight, five thousand one hundred pounds. No, so so are you saying to be clear? Are you saying that there will be nothing for now and there will be no discussion, no new offer before the nurses' next strike? We have to see what the other unions come back with and we'll have to see what the staff council meeting would say. And that will but, be after the but nurses' But our next message strike. is very, very clear, Laura, that this is a very fair and reasonable offer. For a band five, a typical ward level nurse, £5,100 extra pay, including within that £2,000 that they'll be paid by the summer into their account. No. That is a big and, and offer. And you've made that point, but the nurses have said no to the offer as they were entitled to do in their vote. So for our viewers this morning and patients who might be worried about it, the question is, how are you going to stop the strikes taking place? And if you refuse to budge, then the government is allowing another strike to take place that could endanger patients. Well, well, look, let's wait and see what the other unions have to say first as well. There's a lot of other staff out there. Mm -hmm. A unison, as I mentioned, voted by 74% mm -hmm. to accept the offer, mm -hmm. uh, which represents a third of the agenda for change staff. So there's a lot of people accepting what but I think what is a very fair say and reasonable offer. change what the nurses have said. And then you're right, there are different ballots. The GMB is yet to come back. Unite is yet to come back. And we're uncertain about the results. But the point here is that the nurses have said no. And we've been sitting here with ministers since the autumn, week after week, saying, how are you going to stop these disputes happening? How are you going to prevent walkouts? How are you going to stop risks for patients happening? And you're presiding over a situation where operations are being cancelled, patients may face further risks, and you're not telling me what you're going to do about it. You're saying, let's wait and see what the others say. Well, uh, because what I'm saying is that it's a very fair, reasonable offer, first of all. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I just can't stress enough how that is fair, both to nurses, mm -hmm. all of NHS staff, mm -hmm. public sector staff, and to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other unions are balancing at the moment. Mm -hmm. The nurses rejected it narrowly, despite mm -hmm. the recommendation of Pat Cullen and the RCN leadership, which I think is really important, that, mm -hmm. because it was, a part, it was a result and, of a and negotiation. We that, and we discussed that with her. But the point, I think, for our viewers watching this morning is what the government is going to do about it and what the consequences will be for the country. And if you look also at the consequences for the Prime Minister, for your boss, Rishi Sunak, one of his main promises is that he's going to get waiting lists down. Now, how on earth is that going to happen if you've got a series of strikes in the health well, service? That is why Steve Barclay today has written uh, to the RCN mm -hmm. Outlining, mm -hmm. uh, saying very little is what Pat Cullen well, said. Well, I disagree. It's I've not agreeing to talk. I've, I've read the, the I've read the letter. Steve's uh, Steve's door is always open, always open. Um, but we want to see what the other unions have to say, what the other people being balloted have to say about this very, very good offer. And I just stress again: five thousand one hundred pounds mm -hmm. for a band five nurse, two thousand pounds into their account uh, by the summer. That is a very, very good offer. But what has happened to waiting lists since Rishi Sunak made that pledge in January? Well, obviously the strike action has not helped. Uh, we know that we're dealing with the waiting list problem as mm -hmm. a result of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which inevitably led to big delays mm -hmm. in the NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting to grips with that. The mm -hmm. strikes haven't helped, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, there's a real focus there. Steve Barclay, the Prime Minister, personally involved here mm -hmm. in making sure that we do what we can to bring down those waiting lists. Well, but if it's personally the involved, help, it might, but, might not be making that much difference because the waiting Bar lists have got longer, actually. There's 7.2 million people on an NHS waiting list now in February. That is the highest level that it has it ever been. Now, how on earth are you going to get to grips to that if there's a dispute with the nurses, there's a dispute also with the junior doctors? Don't you have to budge on the strikes if you are going to address that very real problem for members of the public? But we have. We have budged because we have made this very, very good offer uh, to all of the unions, to all of the six unions involved. Some are still balloting at the moment. Let's wait and hear their results. But it is a great offer. Five thousand. But the nurses pounds. don't think so, Greg Hans. I mean, our audience will they hear voted you keep saying it's a fair it. offer, but they voted against it, as was their democratic right to do so as a union. You can agree with it. You can be frustrated with it. Of course, it's legitimate to, to say whatever you want about the result. But they voted no. And this is about the consequences. Okay. So again, I'll ask you, we have a record number of people on waiting lists, 7.2 million. How do you think you're going to fix that if industrial disputes are going on in the health service? Or actually, are you going to give up on that pledge? We're definitely not giving up. Uh, we think it's unreasonable to take this strike action. 
particularly at a time when the other unions are balloting, particularly at a time when Unison, which represents a third of all the staff, accepted it by 74%. That is a big majority in favour of this very fair and reasonable offer. But this is about the Prime Minister's promises to the public. I mean, let's look at another of those pledges that he made. He promised to have inflation this year. Actually, since then, inflation went up. Well, nobody has said that it's going to be easy uh, to tame inflation. Let's not forget why is inflation where it is. It's driven principally by higher energy prices, higher input prices, driven by Vladimir Putin's invasion of mm -hmm. Ukraine. So let's mm -hmm. not forget why we have mm -hmm. our high inflation. Yes, and the Prime Minister knew all of that when he made the promise to the public. But let's look at another one. The Prime Minister... We are still working very hard at delivering all of the five priorities, mm -hmm. halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, stopping the boats and reducing hospital waste. And what happened to the economy in February? Well, in February, it was not one of the better results, but January it grew by 0.3%. And we've had the best growth in the G7 in 2021 and 2022. Overall, under this Conservative government, we've got a record to be proud of on growth. And in February, there was zero growth. Are you proud of that? We're well, proud of okay. zero growth okay. in our economy. The, that, that is a monthly figure, Laura. If you look at the previous month, for example, it's plus 0.3. OK, these are... You know, we would like to see much stronger growth. And that is why in the budget we introduced measures to bring people back into the workforce, uh, to make sure that doctors aren't retiring early, which was one of the problems actually that was giving rise uh, to some of the waiting list problems and actually fixing some of those problems in the budget on the 15th of March and driving things forward. But we, of course we want to see growth higher than that. But I say overall, our growth record has not been bad. The highest, the strongest in the G7, 2021 and 2022. Well, maybe we'll um, talk to Stephanie Flanders about that in a couple of minutes. I just want to ask you about another story that's uh, around today. The government is saying that it would not increase the number of smart motorways. Um, you will get rid of, of, of some of them. Um, but are you saying today that actually all smart motorways will disappear? There have been huge concerns about safety, not least um, exposed by some BBC investigation at Panorama a couple of years ago. Um, you've expanded them for a long time. Why are you taking this action now and will you completely get rid of them all? No, we're not saying that. What we've said that we will not approve any new smart motorways, uh, clearly as a result of uh, public concern and safety concern. And we're going to keep a close eye on the situation with the existing smart motorways. But at the moment, the announcement is purely about no new smart motorways. OK, great, Hans. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming in and taking questions on a range of issues. It's good to have you in the studio. Thank you. Right then, it's coming up to 10 o'clock. Time has zipped away, but we began this morning by asking if it was possible to avoid a summer of strikes. Pat Cullen from the Royal College of Nursing told us we might see strikes right up until the end of the year. We have strike action for the end of this month, beginning of May, and then we will move immediately to ballot our members. And if that ballot is successful, it will mean further strike action um, right up until Christmas. Now, the person that can stop that, and the people that can stop that, is Steve Barclay and the ministers, and indeed the Prime Minister. Well, Saffron Cordray, Stephanie Flanders and Mark Bailey, time for a last word with you. Um, Saffron, briefly, from what you heard from Greg Hans, do you think there's a solution to stop the nurses' strike? It doesn't look like it at the moment, but I think it's absolutely critical that the government looks again and that the RTN and the unions look again and come round the table. We're really worried about the impact on an ongoing basis of these strikes. We know they aren't sustainable and we've really got to make sure that we actually find a solution to them. And that's in the hands of the unions and it's in the hands of the government. This is a negotiation and let's handle it as such. OK, and Mark and Stephanie, to you on the economy, we were just briefly there touching with uh, Greg Hans and talking about the UK's growth. Greg Hans was trying to sort of say, actually, the UK's doing pretty well compared to others. Go on, Mark his homework for us, <laughs> Stephanie. Know. Well, you didn't talk about the forecast for this year and next year, which are the worst in the G20, the overall amount of growth. Look, we've got, we've had, year to year, you get catch-up growth, uh, you know, things, things move around. We do know that we were way behind, years behind the US and a long time behind the Eurozone in catching up to where we were before the pandemic. So that's something that you can't get away from. And when you look forward for the next two years, it is the case that we have the, the slowest growth of, the, of all those 20 economies. Mark, very briefly, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Um, I'm optimistic that inflation will pass this year. Right. I'm on the long term. I think there's a huge opportunity for us as a society with the impact of digital and skill sharing um, 
one and a half percent of our, our workforce can take advantage of that, I think we're massively underinvesting. Okay, for the well, but you almost said something cheerful there at the end when we've had quite a lot of difficult <laughs> conversations in the studio uh, th this, this morning. This year should get better. <laughs> okay, all three of you, thank you so much for giving us your insights this morning. Great to have you with us. So, what can we conclude? Well, it, when it comes to the nurses' walkouts, it's hard right now to see how it can be avoided. This morning, the RCN has rejected the government's request to pause strikes. That's bad for politicians. But of course, more importantly, it's likely to hit patients, the wider public. What was a winter of widespread industrial discontent may indeed prove to be a summer of strikes. All politicians, probably all of us, would like to think we're on the way to better health care for all. But while we're still arguing about how to pay the staff and who looks after us or how to make sure there are enough of them willing to do the job, the bigger questions of how we are all cared for might be beyond reach, let alone the Prime Minister's ambition to cut waiting lists. Thank you so much for your company. We'll be back next week as we edge ever closer to those May local elections. And you can catch up on what you've missed on the iPlayer. Have a great Sunday. Goodbye for now.